you like Dan. I see who's standing. I see who's not. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, Bill asked me, was I preaching at the First Baptist Church this morning because I wore a tie? <laughs> but um, I just wanted to be, uh, just because uh, I wanted y'all to know that you don't have to untuck your shirt to minister here. Me and John Wilson, you can tuck your shirt in and actually hear from Jesus. Um, make sure nobody's drank out of this. I'm kind of a germaphobe. So I had, I had, I got to tell you, I got to show you my notes for my, for my sermon. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, there's there's two scriptures. These are my notes. Um, so I sat here and I knew that the Lord um, wanted me to ask Jackie to bring a word, and you brought you brought a word. Um, so I was glad I was hearing from the Lord because that validates everything else that I have to say. Um, so let's pray, Father. Thank you for this morning. I thank you that we meet you, um, not just while we're here in these walls. We meet you in the car driving here. We meet you in places, Father, that we, we spread out and we say, come, Holy Spirit, come. And um, in, in the good times and the bad, Father, at all times, um, we, are, we are in a place that we can hear you because you're always speaking. You're always saying something. You're always confirming something. You're always moving something. And so, Father, I thank you that those things are happening right here in this little window of time. And so, Father, I just pray, Father, that we are, um, we, we don't miss a thing. And God, I thank you that you hide us in the secret place so that you can make yourself known in the public places. So, Father, just do that right now. God, that you be made known, you be made public here. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, so crazy. Um, and Al, is Al here? Okay, so just, um, good morning, Al. Uh, this guy back here, Al. So Al and Holly, um, if there is at any point that you want to interject, if there's something that you feel like the Lord has on your heart as well, um, you have the freedom to do that. Jackie has already spoken. Um, uh, uh, sorry, John, you were just there for the ride. Um, <laughs> but I do feel like that if, uh, if, if, if you two have something that you have to say, I, I, I definitely will step to the side and let you, let you say something. So here is uh, the scripture, Daniel three seventeen through 18. It says, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he would deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that's been set up. But even if he does not, um, I told y'all last December I spent a long time, many hours, listening to Martin Luther King's speeches. And, um, and he, he spoke of this um, about that if not faith the um, we have faith like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that says hey our God will deliver us but even if he doesn't we will not bow and me personally I am a I have uh, I come from the good, good charismatic um world since 2001 and I have uh, I have prayed and believed God many times for him to be the deliverer more than I have prayed for him to be my comforter because I would rather be delivered from something uh, set uh, set outside of that circumstance and instead of allowing him to come in and him be who he is in those circumstances just call me an American I guess or call me selfish but um, I just that's my preference and pastor started out with the scripture today 
that says that Jesus says, I'll, I'll go and I will send you a helper. And the same word is translated as the comforter. And there's a reason that he comes. There's a reason that he comforts. Yes, he's a deliverer. But in my American mentality, I find myself wanting him to deliver, not necessarily to deliver me from strongholds, but to deliver me from things I said yes to when he said, hey, will you say yes to this? Which brings me to the point of, yes, we are foster parents. And we said yes to that. And I have prayed many times, Lord, deliver me. <laughs> Please, deliver me. Um, undoubtedly, I wasn't this bad off that you needed to do this to me. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly I was okay um, I was praying yesterday and I said God made my, made my even on my cellular level may it be genuine to, not just in my conversation not just in my talk but may I be genuinely um, what the kingdom of heaven represents on, even on to the cellular level not just what I speak um, because uh, we can say a lot of things and we can grab the mic and, um, and really say a lot of things that God's not saying. Um, but while my quote-unquote mic is in the hand and it's being a foster parent, I want what my life is saying to them to be genuinely true, and I don't want to just be going through the motions. Um, and I don't want to be saying, God, deliver me from this. I want to be saying, God, comfort me here help me here um, so last week Haviland Haviland the Haviland the Haviland and Will were here and uh, I had was it last week yeah and so I asked um, on Friday or Saturday I was in the car riding and I asked the Lord I said these words I said God so when we get to adopt um, the boys Will I name, will we name him Marcus Moses or Moses Marcus? And, um, and then I said, God, why did I just say that to you? And um, it was clear that that night I got here and the Haviland said something about the stream of foster care and how that there are Moseses being pulled from the stream that will change the world. And I had just asked the Lord, would I name him Mark? Because God named all three of our boys. And so, so we're pretty certain that God has named Marcus, Marcus Moses, or either Moses Marcus. A couple of weeks ago, Lindsay and I went to, I say that because hold on to that story because I want you to hear some confirmations that Jackie and John just did here um, for what I, have, what I feel like the Lord had us to, to, to do today. So a couple of weeks ago, Lindsay and I went to court. We do this every six months for our boys. And the, the judge, um, you know, is supposed to speak to the parents if they show up, see where they are in the process. We've been doing this for 18 months. And they, um, the mom showed up the very first court date. And then after that, she went AWOL. And then um, this time, dad came. And we've never met dad because he's been in jail all this time. These are my prayers um, when, in, in, in the past, especially when we said yes to fostering. And y'all know the whole 222 story, uh, m many of you do, about how God, do what? It's, and many of you have, have heard of me, us say, God said, you know, 222, all this kind of stuff, and then we ended up in, um, getting a call on February the 22nd, on 222, that, and the social worker said, we have placement for two twin two-year-olds and it was um it was you know god had to god in his sovereignty and providence knew that he needed to do that well along the way before that happened before they came so i would know that they were supposed to be in my home when that was being thrown in fiery furnaces and i was <laughs> calling out for deliverance and um 
so these boys, we know they're supposed to be in our home. But my first prayers have always been, God, restore dad, restore mom. Uh, get them off of drugs. Uh, s- let them know who you are. Set them free. May they, uh, may they experience all that you've called and created them to be. May they, may they know family. May they know all the things that you bring to us. Um, so that's always been my prayer. And sometimes selfishly, because the sooner they get it together, the sooner they get these kids out of my house. And then I will have been delivered. Those were some of the prayers. And then when I'm not in my flesh, I actually do say the things I'm supposed to say. And I, I say, um, Lord, not, not my will, but yours be done. And, um, and so, he, yeah. Pastor David said something Wednesday night, and he didn't mean the what I took it as because I was reminiscing over how it was when I grew up in church community. And, um, and he said something, again, he didn't mean it the way I said it, but I just want you to, this is what happens when we do life in a box or in church world. And he said, he said, sometimes you just might need to come down. Just that simple act of obedience. Some breakthrough happens. Some things happen. And, and it, it, where my mind went was, it's unfortunate because that's where a lot of us will stop. If we'll just come down, if we'll just, if we feel like that's the stretch of what God has called us to, that uncomfortable level of just coming out of our seat to come here. <laughs> Yet he is calling us to levels of obedience. Yes, if he's called you to come down here for whatever reason, there may be a cloud of glory right here and you got to run off in it. But, I know, right? Uh, I had this picture. I asked the Lord what he was doing, and I had this picture of, like, the whole, when, you, when you started talking, I had just asked the Lord what, what, what I asked Holy Spirit what he was doing. And I, he was moving so fast right here, just kind of like he was over the waters, over the chaos when he, during creation. That's the picture I saw. And um, I heard the, the rushing sound, and that was all happening right here. And then you got up and started talking about the train. Um, so anyway, the um, squirrel, what was I saying? <laughs> Oh, the obedience. So, so many times I yearn that God has all He had. God, if you would just, if you would have just called me out from my pew, I'd go down front if that's all you want from me. But guys, He's called us to so much more. He didn't do all of that dying and getting beat and all that kind of stuff just to call us to the front of a church. And I and I say that, and that's not what Pastor meant. But I'm saying this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was called to bow to a foreign king, to a, a, a god, lowercase g, and they didn't. Um, Lindsay and I have been called, just as many of you have, uh, but we've been called to foster these two boys and apparently now to adopt them. Uh, so we went to court and we met Dad, and he's, he was a broken man. Because what happened, he gave his life to Christ while he's been in prison this time. And, yeah. So while I've been praying for him to meet Jesus, he met Jesus, but he didn't get his kids. He got something better. Because this guy says, telling Lindsay and I, he said, we grew up, I grew up in foster care. I, went, I was in foster systems from New York, uh, New York to Texas. Been on drugs since he was 10. Uh, but he has such a genuine heart, and he loves his boys. But he can't provide for them whatsoever. He's 28, never had a driver's license. Just living, just living kind of thug life, just uh, that whole dynamic of um, an impoverished mentality of brokenness. He was, like Lindsay said, he just seemed like he was a little boy trapped in a, in a man's body. And um, so it was an emotional day. He wanted to know how his boys were. We showed him pictures and videos and things like that. And, um, and he gets out of jail, and he, has, he, has, he said he has no positive influences in his life. There's no role models. There's nobody. There's only takers in his life. It's just taking, taking, taking. And, um, and he's, he loves his boys enough. He wants the best for them, and he knows that he can't, he can't provide it. 
the life that he envisions for his boys that he loves, he knows he can't give it to them. So he sacrificed his own selfish desires to get to see his boys. He wants to see them. But he says, and he understands that that will mess up their world because it's been over two year, years since they've seen him. And these boys were, that was, they were just over, just had turned two. And so to create another world of chaos, which they already have enough of, um, he chose not to see them. I mean, he, this, has been, this was done in many tears and a very broken heart. And he wanted to know would he be able to see his boys again one day. And, and we made a decision. We shook his hand and said, absolutely. If, if you give up your rights, we'll adopt them. And, and, and you'll get to see your boys one day. And it'll be a day that when you're in a better place and they're in a better place. And it'll be all a part of this story of redemption. It'll be a part of that story. Will and um, Matt Lockett wrote this book, The Dream King. If you may have got it last week, I'd encourage you to get it. It's, it's short. It's an easy read. And Matt talks about the frames of cartoonists when they're, when they're drawing, uh, making a motion picture, and they have to do frame after frame after frame after frame. And many times we get caught on a frame, and we don't see the whole picture. And so in, it's usually I get caught like that when I'm in my flesh. If I'm ever in headspace with Jesus, then I can, see in, I can see down the road, and I have the grace to see down the road. But if I get in my headspace, if I get in my flesh, then I'll stop on a frame, and I'm like, oh, my God. This, I, is, this what, is this what it looks like? Um, or I'm scared. I don't have it, what it takes, Lord, if this is, if this is what it's going to be because I'm not, I'm not in the same headspace with Jesus. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had that faith, and yes, God delivered them. But I want to take you to 2 Kings. This whole thing about the siege is over has gripped me because it lines up with what I feel like. I mean, who wouldn't want the siege to be over, right? Dutch Sheets said here, he said, the siege is over, and it's time for suddenlies. Um, and just as he prefaced, he says, I don't, I don't preach that sermon that, hey, suddenlies are here so that we can all feel good about all the harsh stuff's over. Because that's not what God's called us to anyway. I was uh, listening to Tommy Tenney this past week, and, um, and he said these words, something about the suffering of hope. Um, it just, it just kind of resonated something in me. You know, um, those boys, Daddy, he has a hope that, those, that their life will not be like his. Yet that creates an element of suffering in his life because he doesn't get to see that happen. But the hope holds, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hold him. More, it's going gonna, it's gonna to supersede the suffering. And I feel like that we've been, we've been called to do big things, good things, um, hard things. But it's, it's that hope that, that, oh, that, um, that, yes, there's some suffering in the hoping. Because it's because we're not just sitting on our tails. We're doing the things God's calling us to. We're saying we'll get in the fire if he does, if he don't. God's God. So the siege is over, 2 Kings chapter 19. This is about Hezekiah. And so I don't know if it was Will or Dutch, or I didn't get to come to all of those meetings. Um, but they said something about this angel killing 185,000, the enemy, going through the enemy camp and killing 185,000. And I was reading uh, this story um, about when, I mean, here comes the enemy's camp they, uh, of the Assyrians, and they come up, and they're over here at a water duck, and they're going to cut the water off. They were going to do all these things, and they were going to, the siege over uh, Judah was going to happen um, of Jerusalem here, and um, I think it was Jerusalem, yes. And so, um, so the messenger, they, he gets a letter to give to Hezekiah the king. And this is where I, I just, I just want to read a couple of verses. Um, it's um, uh, 14, 2 Kings 19, 14. 
And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers, and he read it. And Hezekiah went to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, hear, open your eyes, O Lord, and see, hear the words which has been sent to reproach you, the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste. And he goes on and talks about what the letter says. <clears throat> now, prior to this, they had, they had reached out to Isaiah, the prophet, what the word of the Lord would be. They ended up getting this threat, and it's a gross threat. I mean, he, actually, he told them, he said, y'all going to be eating your poop and, and drinking your urine. That's what's fixing to happen to y'all. And don't lie, don't be deceived that your living God is going to deliver you. And this, was the, this is what was on the message. And um, in such, Hezekiah was, didn't want him to even speak in Hebrew because he didn't want anybody to hear him. Don't say any of that because I, I don't want the people on the wall to hear it. I don't want them to know what's coming up. And so, you know, I, I looked at this like, uh, okay, I was praying yesterday, and our address is 112 Coal Road, and we get a lot of mail there. I mean, that's our address. And, um, and I was thinking, you know, some letters we get, I'd, I'd, um, I just throw them away. Uh, because it, they don't apply, they're junk. And then there's some letters that come and they, they're a little heavier. They usually have the windows in them and they, they want money. Um, that's, uh, and thankfully, both my wife works and makes good money. We usually can pay our bills. Um, but there are some things that come into my life, um, metaphorically, letters to my mailbox that are from the enemy. And yes, they may have came to my address, but they're not for me. And the only thing I know to do is to take them to the Lord. Like Hezekiah and just spread out. This is what the crap says in the letter, Lord, right here. This is what it says. You're going to have to tell me what to do here. You're, this isn't... This says my name on it, yes, but this is junk the enemy's been throwing my way. This is junk the enemy's been trying to say to me all this time that he's going to do to me. This is what's going to happen. This is the shame. This is the guilt. This is the, this is the, this is the, this is the diagnosis. This is whatever. You know, this, life's going to be hard now because these two kids have, that's in your house have got all kinds of junky issues, and you're already having to take them to therapy. You ain't seen nothing yet. You know, all this stuff the enemy says. Uh, the enemy's scary, you know, the enemy, that's, and he's a liar, he can't tell the truth. Um, so, so all of this, um, Hezekiah spreads this out in front of the Lord, in the temple, in the house of the Lord, and prays. And then he gets word from the prophet. And prior to that, there's this word that I had never even heard of, and it's called a siege mound or a siege ramp. And that's what the enemy does when they come up on a fortified city. They build this ramp. Or they'll roll, around, roll this tower up and so it protects the enemy as they approach the wall they can get in. Or they put all this debris and they pile it up up against a wall so where they can go into or and attack a, what's a fortified city. And so I was, I was caught by that because let's just say the siege is over because this what does happen is Hezekiah spreads out before the Lord he gives him the letter that the enemy has said this is what's going to happen to you you're going to eat your poop and you're drinking your own urine we're fixing to cut the water off we're fixing to attack haven't you seen what we've done to all the other cities haven't you seen reality haven't you seen this is how it's going to happen how dare you say it's not going to happen like this because this is how it's always happened haven't you seen the telltale signs? Who are you to believe the living God is actually going to do anything different? 
And then Isaiah, because Hezekiah prayed, Isaiah the prophet got the word. And it's a picture of what John and Jackie just did. They got in their room, and they worshiped. And they say, God, this is, what, this is what's being said. What do you say? Because I'm here to tell you, if you don't hear from the Lord, you will make up all kinds of stuff. And you will believe all kinds of mail. All kinds of letters. All kinds of assaults. All kinds of reports. If you haven't stopped to spread before the Lord and hear what he has to say. And, I, and that's what we're going to do. I'm just to end here shortly. And we're going to spend just a minute trying to hear, not trying. You're going to hear from the Lord. Because when I did this yesterday, yes, I just came off of a um, running for a state representative for District 77. And I knew that the Lord said I would finish strong. And for about the first week, I did finish strong. And then after that, I went... Um, like like a sled like you're just sitting on a like a, a sled and you're going downhill and you have no control you don't have the sticks or anything like that and you're just like free falling now that's, that's kind of where I went from there because you know the, yes God spoke even to the end I, I lost by 76 votes needing 77 votes to win district 77 um, God the spirit of the Lord spoke from beginning to end but I know what's on the inside of me, and I know what's in the political realm, and I know what needs to happen in this. I, I know that there needs to be, just as, just as uh, Matthew says in, 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 in Matthew 4, and in, in, in it says that Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, we, hear, we see tw on Twitter, I've got a Twitter account after it, because you have to do that when you're running for things. And so I got this Twitter account, and it says, I see it often now, I didn't realize it, but they do this often where it says um, the White House has put out a report or the White House has said this. Now, we know the White House doesn't speak. I mean, literally, it doesn't have the White House is not speaking. So when they say that, they know what they're saying. The government, our government, this is the statement our government is, is, is put out. And it's the same thing when the kingdom, this is what the kingdom is saying. This is what the kingdom, uh, this, is, this is what the government of God, this is what the ecclesia, this is what the kingdom, the very thing that encompasses all of God, this is what he's saying. So, so I want to say that there is something that God, that there's something the kingdom has to say about some of the things you're going to spread out here in just a minute, okay? Um, so yesterday, I took communion because I, I have been on this little... I, like I said, I've been on a free fall, emo, free fall emotionally in my soul. And I told God yesterday, I, I spread some stuff out for him, and I took communion. And Miss Joe asked me this morning, she said, hey, do you have a title for your sermon? And uh, so 30 minutes later, uh, well, I had wrote this yesterday during my time of communion, and on the top of it, I put, in remembrance, I remember. And so I said, that'll be my title. In remembrance, I remember. So yesterday, I poured me a glass of wine, and I took my, some cracker, and I put it there in front of me, and I had Matt's CD playing, of which I've played all week a lot, and I've, I encourage you to, to get it and um, not just support the guy that we believe hears from Jesus and, and brings that worship here, but just to, just to know for yourself, guys, it's some good stuff. And it's instrumental, which I like because I don't like a whole lot of words. I just like, I like that, and I want to hear God speak. And that's why I'm going to stop talking in just a minute. Um, but so I, I went to pick up the, the cracker, and I said, and I, rem I, was just, I had my eyes closed, and I saw the table where it says from the Good Baptist Church, do this in remembrance of me. And so I was like, okay. And I saw Jesus approaching. He had his washcloth over his hand. And he was, he was fisted. I saw him doing the act of washing his disciples' feet. Because he was doing that before the Lord's Supper there. Um, 
And then I just, I started remembering that about his body and that his body was broken for mine. And I started remembering that in 2001, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I started remembering what it felt like and how life for me completely changed and how the, the infilling of his Holy Spirit on that level catapulted me into dreams that I never knew to dream until that happened. And I was remembering all those things with the, just in the presence of him washing his disciples' feet and me kind of being there and, um, and just thinking about his body. And, and I got to thinking about his, what he's done, what he has said to me. And I just started writing stuff down. And I, I'm going to share those in just a second. But it was in that remembrance that I remembered and I needed to be reminded I needed to be reminded that you know God yes this is tough on my flesh yes that's probably a good thing yes you have called me you have put these boys in our family I didn't see this coming but you, had some, you have something to say about this I really wanted to win representative, but I didn't. You have something to say about that. You have something to say about all these things. And I started remembering, and the reason I stopped at 2001, which was pretty cool that they said in 17 years ago, because the other night when Holly spoke, I asked the Lord, I asked the Lord, what's the word? At the very end, she was praying. I said, God, what's your word? And um, yes, Elijah, I'm going to say the word. So I heard God say, Mr. Snuffleupagus. <laughs> I hadn't heard that word since I was 10 years old. So it had to be Jesus. He said, Mr. Snuffleupagus. And so I, uh, I have Googled Mr. Snuffleupagus, and I realized, oh, that's the elephant. That was my favorite Sesame Street character. Mr. Snuffleupagus was not visible for 17 years. He wasn't allowed to be, he, they did not expose him until the 17th year. He was only Big Bird's imaginary friend. And I know the elephant has a lot to do with the prophetic and things like that. Um, and so there's a lot to be said on, with that, and God has been cracking that open and peeling that onion back. It's just to hear what the Lord has to say replaces nothing. I mean, it is, it is, uh, it's it's the creme to the of the creme, whatever you, that whatever that French word talk is. <laughs> it's top shelf. Um, another reference to good wine. It's top shelf. When he said Mr. Snuffleupagus, and I Googled, and, it, and I realized the story was that, and I, told, I was having lunch with Elijah, and I said, Elijah, there's something about, there's something the Holy Spirit has to say about this. And as soon as I said that to Elijah, it's like heaven opened up and I saw it. And I'm in Aladdin's. And I have, and I'm crying, and I'm like, sorry, Elijah, I need to go. I, this is when I should be in my pasture. This is when I should be in my truck. Because I know what I dreamed in 2001 when I got spirit-filled. I know what God has said to me. I know what lays on the inside of me. And that this is the season of revealing. Dan stood right over there yesterday, last Sunday, and he said, hey, I got a word for you. And he said, it's like a gender reveal. When they pop the balloon, pink or blue comes out. But So you're like at this gender reveal or at this reveal, and the balloon's being popped, and all that comes out is confetti. It's like it's fisting to be revealed. The week before, I, I shared with Holly about Mr. Snuffleupagus a word, and she says, oh, the things I've prayed in 2001. 17 years ago, Naomi had a dream, you know. 
So yes, there's something significant, and I wasn't going to bring that up, but after they said that, it just something keeps resounding um, about 17. And I hope that in just a minute where you're spread it out, that God speaks to you about something there. But for me, who's been weary, who's been on the sled, my soul just kind of pre-falling because of some hurts and pains, um, and we're not going to, Bobby, you can come back down here. Um, you're going to, yeah. You're going to get to participate. If you'll go ahead and turn that on, I'm only going to say one more thing, and if that, and then I want um, Miss Jackie to say something. But this is what I this is yesterday when I was taking communion with the Lord. Um, I needed God to say something. I needed Him to speak to some of the letters that I believe from the enemy for the last few weeks. I needed Him to say something, and I did it in communion with Him. And I did it in remembering what he did in his body, what he did in his blood being poured out for me. And this is what he said, which is, I didn't, I quickly had to get a piece of paper because I saw that he wanted me to write something down. And he said, I said, you've set my feet up on the rock. You call me by name. I started remembering. And then I had to start saying what my response was. So you set my feet on the rock, and I said, God, I stand firm. You called me by my name. God, I answer. You fill me with light. I shine. I remember that you direct my steps. I'll keep walking. You cherish our relationship. I said, I'll submit to your love. These came out like machine guns. They were like this. You bend your ear. I'll whisper. You quickly show mercy. I cry. You lead me beside still waters. I'll stop and look. You calm my soul. I relax. You took the time. And I said, I feel wanted. You answered the questions. I've got a lot more. You stayed. It's made all the difference. ever felt like somebody walked out on you? you? Ever felt like God walked away? You will remember, guys, he stayed. He always has stayed. You made me hungry, and I hunger still. You have filled me, and I'm not going back. And as David said this morning, you changed me. You hide me in the secret place to reveal you in the public place. It's in remembrance that I remember that you have something to say to every letter that comes with my name on it, but it's not for me. There's a tax that's been set out against you. You live in a fallen world. You live in a crazy, chaotic time. There's all kind of letters that's coming your way. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes right after Miss Jackie speaks. And I just want you to spend, it's going to, I want to do about four times, and I don't want anybody to come up here and grab the mic, because I want you to hear what the Lord has to say. He has something to say, and you just, you get in your mind some of the things that you need to spread out. And I'm not doing this because Hayes finally gets the time to talk up here and wants some emotional experience to happen. That's not what this is. This is a time that you can, you can hear from Jesus about some things that you've been believing otherwise. Or Miss Jackie. Hayes, it's, you know I homeschool, and um, we've been reading a book. It's called The God King. 
and it's, um, it's a historical fiction based on what the Israelites were going through when the Assyrians came against them. And for two weeks, Miss Rethi, you know this. You gave me this word also. You confirmed it this week. And it's how they felt as they looked out and they saw Sennacherib and the Assyrians getting closer and closer and closer and their food was running out and their water was running out and all they could see was destruction all the way around them. And then Hezekiah laid it before the Lord and he said, okay, Lord, this is yours. This is yours. And for at least two weeks, that's all I've been talking about around my house is laying it before the Lord. Hmm. And then when... Miss Ruthie, she called me on Wednesday at a moment I needed somebody to call me and she said, Jackie, we're laying this before the Lord. We're laying it before the Lord. And I knew it was a confirmation that this is the moment, this is the time. The Assyrians, the spirit of Assyria has, even across the body of Christ, has come against us and made us feel like they're, they've cut off our, they try to cut off our food and our water and made us feel like we're going under. And I looked up the spirit of Assyria And it said, it's reasoning that's contrary to the word of God. It will overwhelm you. It will torment you. It will paralyze you. It will aberrate you. It will lie to you. And it's a heavy yoke because in Isaiah 10, 27, it says, because of the anointing oil, the yoke is broken. And it's talking about the Assyrian's yoke. And I feel that this is a divine moment. This is, this, there's, it's not just, you didn't just pull this out of the hat. The Lord told you to preach on this. This morning, we're to lay this stuff before the Lord that we've been lied to, believing that this was going to happen. That's not going to happen. That's That's not what's going to happen. My daughter wasn't just going to have to come home and settle for nothing. Her dreams came true. And wherever God, uh, wherever the Lord, um, the Lord has told you something, the enemy has lied and said it's not going to happen. He's going to do it. We're going to lay it before the Lord because he's going to do it. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. Just like with, just like, thank you for sharing that. I knew that, I knew God was doing the right thing. I mean, I knew I was hearing God say the right thing when, when I asked God, when God said that about Marcus, that he was a Moses, it changed everything. It was a new narrative. This is what God has to say about the kid that's living in my house. These people, these, these little guys will deliver, a, deliver a, a whole group of people, deliver a nation. They will model to the world what, what sacrificial love looked like when dad gave away his rights so that they would know what, what, what they know now. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to just spend about four or five minutes. Everybody's going to be quiet. It's 12.10, at 12.15, we'll stop, and you can be released. But then there's going to be people down here that, that will, just as, just as Hezekiah went to, and Isaiah says, this is what the word of the Lord is. There are also people that will be able to hear, help you hear. But I want you to hear what Jesus has to say. So we just release the spirit of prophecy right now. The spirit of Christ. Holy Spirit, come and speak. Have your way.